when uh, Governor Palin said she could see Russia, I sent her a telegram saying to be careful because that meant Russia could see her. <laughs> but I hail from Kentucky, where it's a tradition to begin by saying, hi folks, I hope you're having a good day and that I don't make it worse because I am not the bearer of the tigers. We meet today amid the worst and potentially most dangerous American-Russian confrontation in many decades, I would say since the Cuban Missile Crisis. We are already in a new Cold War, potentially a Cold War more dangerous than the one the world barely survived for these reasons. Because the epicenter of this Cold War is not in faraway Berlin, but right on Russia's borders. Because this Cold War may tempt the use of what are euphemistically called tactical nuclear weapons. And because unlike during the preceding Cold War, there is no effective American opposition to this unfolding Cold War not in the administration, not in Congress, not in the establishment media, not in the universities, not in the think tanks. It was different in the 70s and 80s. We were organized, we had a political lobby group called the American Committee on East West Accord. We had allies everywhere. So this means that we, and I speak we generically, but only for myself, we, the opponents of this new code, are few in numbers and virtually alone, without influential allies or supporters. In my limited time, I will speak about this dire situation. I think it's a fateful turning point in history. Very gently, very emphatically, very <coughs> candidly, and without the academic usual on the one hand and on the other hand. I will leave the other hand to others. And I'll do so in my three personal capacities as a participant in the very meager mainstream media debate that was permitted mainly in February and March. It ended with the Malaysian aircraft, Donald Sterling, and I forget what now. As a long time, 40 years, I guess, scholarly historian of Russia and American-Russian relations. And lastly, as a policy analyst who believes that there's a way out of this terrible crisis. First, as a participant in the short-lived mainstream media discussion, I'm going to do something unusual for me. I'm going to speak in a very personal way and only for myself. And I do this for two reasons. One, because I am among the oldest chronologically, biologically, among today's speakers. I've been through this before, and I learned a few lessons. And, more personally, because what I've written, what I've said on television, and on radio, since February, has brought upon me an unprecedented personal assault, unlike anything I had experienced even during the last Cold War. I am being called by reputable, allegedly, publications, even purportedly liberal publications, and I quote, as Putin's number one American apologist, Putin's number one useful idiot, Putin's, Putin's dupe, toady, and generally, Putin's best friend. Actually, I've never met him. <laughs> I haven't replied to any of these bits of slander until today. But I'm going to do so today because I think upon rereading them, as I did two days ago, they're directed at me, but they apply to others. They're meant to apply to others in this room and others who are opposing American policy. And rereading them, I've come to these conclusions about these attacks. First, I cannot find in any of them a single factual refutation of one thing I've written or said. Only ad hominem slurs based on distortions and on the general premise that any American who tries 
to explain Moscow's perspective on this crisis. <coughs> Indulging in the old American adage, there's two sides to every story. Except when it comes to Russia, it seems. And anybody who does that, or tries to do it, who says on television, look, stop for a minute and think how this is viewed from the Kremlin, from Russia, is automatically a Putin apologist, and unpatriotic, and disloyal. Second, I see in these character assassins, because what they are, a sizable number of longtime proponents of the policy toward Russia, 20-year policy, that brought us to this disaster. People unwilling to rethink or take responsibility for their complicity. And therefore, in a way, they're defending themselves, concealing their culpability by attacking us. Most of them, however, are trying to do something very wrong. They're trying to stifle democratic debate in America about this historic crisis. They are trying to stigmatize us, or me, and others like me. There have been others. Even Ambassador Jack Matlock, the most moderate and conservative wise of men, has been called a Putin apologist. Reagan's ambassador in Moscow. They're trying to stigmatize us so that we can't or we aren't welcome on mainstream television and opinions, and they have largely succeeded. When's the last time you saw one of us on the New York Times op page? How many of us submitted and been rejected <coughs> or banished to what's now known as the international New York Times, which nobody in this country sees? This means, though, that we, the dissenters, are the truly democratic Americans. We are not trying to silence our new cold warriors. We want to engage them in a public debate, in the media, at hearings in Congress, wherever a democracy permits such a debate. And moreover, and I always say this, we are the patriots of American national security. It is we who understand the dire consequences of this policy, this American policy, for American national security. If nothing else, if no more, this policy is costing Washington its most essential partner in vital areas of American national security, the president of Washington. And that's true whether we talk about Iran or Syria or Afghanistan or international terrorism or nuclear proliferation. No leader can help us more than Vladimir Putin. Perhaps no longer. But we are we're to blame. Some of us are also to blame. We aren't organized. We used to be organized in the 70s and 80s. Gilbert Doctorow in Brussels is trying to organize a new version of the American Committee on East West Accord with Europe. And he was doing very well until the Ukrainian crisis broke out. The old one was funded primarily by CEOs, Don Kendall of PepsiCo, Tom Watson of IBM. So we need the CEOs. It requires a budget and an office and an infrastructure. We don't have the money individually. But we're disorganized, unorganized. We don't defend each other. How dare anybody forgive each other? Call Ambassador Jack Matlock a Putin apologist. How dare they? And we all should have written a letter or written to the producers of those broadcasts and say, how dare you? But we don't defend each other. So we're atomized. Still worse in our democracy, where dissent, the risk of dissent is very cheap compared to other societies. <gasps> Many people tell us they agree with us, senators and congressmen and editors, news and TV producers, but they are silent. But silence today is not a patriotic option except for young people who are most vulnerable to the US. And I've had maybe a dozen queries about young professors and young journalists saying, 
you know, I'd like to speak out, like you and the others, what should I do? And I say, get your seniority and protect your career and family first. You're no good to anybody if you lose your position you weren't promoted. So I exempt you young people in the room who want to fight from this imperative that silence is no longer a patriotic function. Finally, regarding our new, our struggle for a wiser American policy, I come to this conclusion, and I include myself. Most of us were raised and educated to believe that moderation is always the best person. It's an American faith, moderation. But moderation in a time of such crisis is no virtue. Is no virtue. It lulls us into conformism and deference. Since the 1990s, reckless notions about post-Soviet Russia and American policy have congealed into a bipartisan American orthodoxy in the political media establishment. The only remedy for orthodoxy is heresy. So let us be patriotic heretics, regardless of the personal consequences. And I shift now to my capacity as a historian of that orthodoxy. Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, famously said, everyone is entitled to his own opinions, but not to his own facts. This orthodoxy rests almost entirely on fallacious opinions, myths, russophobia, and the demonizing of proof. Five fallacies are particularly relevant, relevant to our discussion in the crisis today. Fallacy number one. Ever since the end of the Soviet Union, Washington has treated post-communist Russia generously as a, a desired friend and partner making every effort to help Russia become a democratic, prosperous part of the European security system. Willingly or unable, Russia rejected this American altruism, emphatically under Putin. Fact, beginning in the 1990s with the Clinton administration, every American president and Congress since has treated post-Soviet Russia as a defeated nation in the Cold War. A nation with inferior, if any, it sometimes to, domestic rights and interests at home or abroad. Though this winner take all approach toward Russia has been spearheaded, of course, by NATO expansion, accompanied by something called selective cooperation, which means non reciprocal American taking of concessions from Russia. And now, importantly, by missile defense, which is a NATO project. It has, of course, excluded Russia from the, European, from the European security system since the end of the Cold War, not included it. Early on in his march on Moscow, it was clearly stated that the great prize was Ukraine. Fallacy number two, there exists a nation called the Ukraine and the Ukrainian people who yearn to escape Russia's centuries of influence and join us, the West. Fact, every informed person knows that Ukraine is a country long divided by profound historical, ethnic, linguistic, religious, cultural, economic, and political differences, particularly between its southeastern and western regions, but not only. If there was ever a divided country, created by history, or if you're of that flame of mind, by God, it is Ukraine. When the current crisis began in 2013, Ukraine had one state, but it was not a single people or a united nation. Fallacy number three. In November 2013, Washington and the European Union offered Ukraine's President Yanukovych a benign association with European democracy and economic prosperity. Yanukovych was prepared to sign the agreement, but Putin bullied and bribed him into rejecting it. And thus began the peaceful protest at Maidan, in Kiev, and all that followed. In fact, the EU proposal was a reckless provocation compelling a democratically elected president of a profoundly divided country to choose between Russia and the West. Putin said, wait, how about a tripartite arrangement? 
Russia, the EU, and Ukraine. And the EU rejected Putin's proposal. It was either or, and therefore reckless and provocative. Neither was the EU proposal economically plausible and required Ukraine to adopt austerity measures. You've seen the consequences in Europe. That would have been explosive in a country as fragile and divided as Ukraine. Nor was the EU proposal, and this is important, entirely benign. It included written protocols requiring Ukraine to adhere to Europe's, I quote, military and security policies. Without mentioning NATO, it meant NATO. I know of no other European <laughs> organization that it could have referred to. In short, it was not Putin's alleged aggression, as we read every day that initiated today's crisis, but instead a kind of velvet aggression by Washington and Brussels to bring Ukraine into the West, including into NATO. Fallacy number four. Today's unfolding civil war in Ukraine was caused by Putin's aggressive response to Maidan and its peaceful protest. Fact. In February, a radicalized Maidan, Maidan, Maidan protest strongly influenced by surging extreme nationalist, even neo-fascist, turned violent. We all saw the word footage, if you watched any television other than American television, of people shooting at policemen and throwing Molotov cocktails and of snipers, who turn out, it seems, not to have been the other This is true violence and would not be tolerated in any American or European city including Alaska, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> European foreign ministers tried to broker an agreement, and they did. An agreement between Yanukovych and the moderate parliamentary leaders of my God. An agreement that would have left, and you all know this, Yanukovych as president until December, not till June now, but seven months from now to December, when there would be new presidential and parliamentary elections. And there would be a coalition government of reconciliation. It was a good idea. It was overthrown within 14 hours by violent men in masks in the streets. The so-called moderate Ukrainian leaders capitulated to the street. If you saw the picture of the six foot eight cleats coat of the former heavyweight boxing champion of the world, cowered before a guy half my size you'll understand the political force the street had acquired, shown on television repeatedly. The United States and Europe did not defend its own negotiated agreement. Didn't step in and say, wait, everybody signed this. Yanukovych fled, as any of us would. His life was in danger, most of us. And so these minority parliamentary parties, including the neo-fascists, of the party, formed the new Kiev government. Washington and Brussels immediately endorsed it and, and supported it even today. Everything that followed, Russia's annexation of Crimea, whatever we think of that, the spread of rebellion in the southeast of Ukraine, the ongoing civil war was triggered by that coup like change of Kiev in February, not by Putin. Fallacy five. The only way out of the crisis is for Putin to end his, quote, aggression in Ukraine, or as the New York Times and Washington Post say every other day, for Putin to back off. Then good things will happen. In fact, the underlying causes of the Ukrainian crisis are Ukraine's own internal indigenous historical divisions, not primarily Russia's. Washington and Brussels ignited these divisions back in November 2013. Putin has reacted ever since. He's one of the great reactors. But he didn't begin this. But he intends to finish it. But he didn't begin it. We did. Perpetuating and inflaming the crisis today is primarily Kiev's what he calls an I don't know why it would, or any government would. Abraham Lincoln didn't. But Kiev calls its anti-terrorist operation against the rebellion in southeast Ukraine. 
What kind of government calls its own citizens who are politically protesting terrorists? <laughs> a government that tends to kill them instead of negotiating with them. I repeat, Lincoln didn't do that. He appealed to the Confederacy, to my state, Kentucky, and my fellow citizens, come home. Only the Obama administration can compel Kiev to stop this atrocious military campaign, which has created a humanitarian disaster. And not only the Slavans, the Lugans, or the Luhans, depending on whether you're Russian or Western, but throughout many, maybe a dozen southeastern cities. Putin influences, and I have no doubt, he aids the rebels, directly and indirectly. Not as much as Washington plans but more than he admits. And if the assault by Kia on the Southwest ends, I have no doubt Putin can compel the rebels to come to the negotiating table. In short, 20 years of U.S. policy has led to this fateful American-Russian confrontation. Putin undoubtedly contributed to it along the way during his 14 years in power. But his role has overwhelmingly been a reactive one. If there's ever been a reactive foreign policy leader, Bob Leopold is an authority on this. I am not. It seems to me Putin has been a reactive foreign policy leader throughout his career. So I end by asking, what next? And the short is, it, it, uh, answer is books none. God knows. But there are three outcomes conceivable. First, the unfolding Ukrainian civil war escalates and widens and runs the risk, the high risk, of thereby drawing in Russian and NATO troops. This would be the worst outcome. This would be war between the United States and Russia. War. We came close in Georgia. Here, it won't be near this. That's the worst outcome. The second possibility is that the de facto partitioning of Ukraine, which we're witnessing today, with one government in Kiev and so-called autonomous governments forming in the southeast, is institutionalized in the form of two Ukrainian states. One allied with Russia, one with the West, both living somewhere between Cold War and Cold Peace. This is not the best outcome, but it is far from the worst. The best outcome, of course, most of us would agree. Though there are advocates of partitioning Ukraine. And have made a semi-compelling argument for this. But the best outcome would be to preserve Ukraine as a unitary state under one state. This will require, everybody knows, negotiations among representatives of all Ukraine's diverse regions under the auspices of Washington, Moscow, and Brussels. Three general goals or principles of such negotiations are well known to every informed policymaker in every country involved without exception. So I will just tick them off and not dwell on them. Ukraine must become a federalized state giving its diverse regions enough autonomy to elect their own officials, live according to their local cultures, and have a say in tax and budgetary issues as is the case in federal states for Canada to join. To achieve this, undoubtedly new parliamentary elections will be required, possibly a national referendum. I don't know. Ukraine must not, under any circumstances, be allied with any military alliance, any military bloc, including NATO. Nor, I add, must Georgia or any more former Soviet republics become members of NATO. This will become a chain reaction crisis. With these principles, and I should add, Ukraine must, must maintain or develop economic relations both with Russia and the West. Otherwise, it cannot be politically independent or economically prosperous. It needs Russia. It probably needs the West. I'm not sure about it. Maybe it needs Russia. It has more the market. But even if such negotiations will never succeed, and maybe never begin, 
until Kiev stops its military operations in eastern Ukraine. And that is the political responsibility, above all, of the Obama administration, which supports Kiev and so forth. Moscow, I think, will respond. So I conclude, all of this is obvious and attainable, but it is also urgent. Kiev's anti-terrorist operation is committing more and more atrocities every week, with the apparent support of the Obama administration. That is, it's being done in our name. Meanwhile, Putin, and this is little known, is under mounting pressure in Russia, in pro-Kremlin newspapers, to do something to protect the citizens of Southeast Ukraine. The prevailing proposal is that he immediately enact a no-fly zone over Southeast Ukraine, as we did in Libya, and destroy Ukrainian aircraft, heavy artillery, and tanks in any approach, he says. And he's being charged with indecision at best. He is under attack at home. Meanwhile, the casualties are there. And meanwhile, there is no such leadership here in Washington. President Obama has utterly vanished as a crisis time states. Vanished to where I do not. Secretary of State speaks publicly as Secretary of War. He is not our chief diplomat any longer. Nor are his spokesmen at the State Department. The established immediate cheerleads for Kiev, using misinformation out of Kiev almost daily in his lead story, omitting many crucial facts and diverse, diverse opinions. And so we, the dissenters, are few, alone, and often defended. For perspective, I best can do, the best I can do is quote Mikhail Gorbachev who said of his struggle for reform inside the even more orthodox Soviet nomenclatura, the following. Everything new in philosophy begins as heresy. And everything new in politics begins as the opinion of a minority. So let us be minority in